Greetings and welcome to the East Kimian webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listening-only mode. If at any time during the conference you need to reach an operator, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Tuesday, October 22nd, 2019. I'll now like to turn the conference over to Bradford Wilkie. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Bradford Wilkie. I'm the uh, Acting Assistant Director for Stakeholder Engagement here at CISA. Uh, that may be a uh, new name for you. So that is your U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency uh, within the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, today I have the privilege of, uh, you know, uh, telling you a little bit about e-skimming from our perspective at CISA uh, and then very much uh, handing over to the experts who are actually working uh, cases and, and working with you as both um, businesses and consumers uh, to see what we can do in that last mile to um, address these issues, uh, uh, e-skimming, uh, an uh, area of fraud that we really want to tamp down on, get the message out, and uh, get your participation on. Um, but also, uh, you know, kind of remind you that you're a, you're a clear partner of ours in this too. And, you know, while we're going to kind of lay out some ideas for you, uh, your cooperation, your feedback, uh, and your participation to help reduce the risk area is really important here. Uh, we know that you're in the last mile and that you're the ones that are um, really at the whipping end of uh, some of this, this uh, e-commerce fraud. Uh, I've got a couple of, of key takeaways I'd like to kind of have everybody hold in their mind as you listen to the speakers today. Um, I think I mentioned already one of them, but you know everybody is really involved in e-commerce, uh, and therefore, since everybody's involved, we're really uh, uh, saved by the same risk space. So both as consumers and businesses, no matter size, uh, really every one of us is online at some time, you know, probably in our day, probably uh, all the time on, during our day. Certainly, our um, if you think about your digital persona, kind of exists 24/7. And I think in a small business mentality, our businesses exist 24 by 7, even though we may close the, the physical brick and mortar facility uh, at the end of the day. So, you know, with that in mind, uh, there's a lot of potential for, um, you know, the good and bad, right? The, the things we expect to happen with our businesses, transactions, and interaction with customers, and certainly the potential for compromise of everything from our uh, payment card infrastructure and the way that you're taking payments and also certainly the uh, the customer end of things where there's a lot of personal identifiable information that's shared uh, during those transactions. So there's really a lot at stake. Um, if you know if your business is compromised, you're certainly harmed yourself and there's a risk to that. Um, but you're also, you know, you've got your customers in harm's way too. And you know, it's a responsible activity uh, really to you know make sure that we're not just protecting reputations of businesses and, and profits. We're also looking at it from the customers and the clients end of things. Um, there's a lot of uh, scary statistics out there. I'll just share one of you, one or two, with you today. Uh, according to the 2019 uh, Verizon uh, data breach report, 43% uh, of uh, breaches really involve small businesses. Um, you know that that to me kind of signals the uh, the attack surface that we're talking about here. Um, this. Uh, E-skimming really is, is what was noticed by us in the law enforcement community uh, well over a year ago, and, and certainly it's nothing new, but I think some of the tactics you're going to hear about today, uh, we need, again, your help and your, uh, your, your you know, be purposeful uh, as you listen to these things and see what kind of actions you can take as a business. Um, but we also see a correlation between businesses that are breached uh, and, you know, the failure of their, of their business uh, after the breach. And, while we don't have a lot of good statistics there, uh, I think the last thing we want is excellent uh, businesses and, and products to leave the marketplace because of uh, the, the work of adversaries to breach uh, either, again, the, the PII side or the actual uh, financial side of, of, our orga of these organizations. Uh, so that, that takes me sort of my last point, and then uh, we'll get started with our excellent uh, guest speakers today. You know, vigilance is essential, and I think uh, in, in this in this era, we're really looking at uh, vigilance as a collective defense activity, right? It, it takes, it takes uh, us on watch uh, with you. It takes the businesses and consumers. Uh, it, it even takes the whimsical of knowing where that cyber 911 call is going to be placed if you're a small business and 
uh, you have ransomware, e-skimming, fraud, or something that's in the cyber uh, arena as, as an attack or compromise, uh, knowing who to work with and at what speed uh, you can work with partners that are outside of your organization, I think is, um, is something we've all got to kind of collectively work on together. If you're the consumer, you know, paying attention to anything that's unusual at your checkout, um, you know, you're checking a, uh, banking statements and looking for pending transactions in your credit card, certainly those are, you know, good due diligence. Uh, we're about to approach this uh, busy shopping season, and I know I'll be using the features of my credit cards that allow me to freeze things between uh, planned purchases of, you know, significant size and certainly looking at where I, whether I use debit or credit uh, at certain sites online as I do my, my holiday shopping. If I'm a business, I'm thinking, uh, you know, through the lens of how, how am I doing this payment processing and what kind of payment vendors am I working with. I um, need to pay attention to, you know, how I can uh, get the customer involved if they suspect fraud that maybe came through my small business uh, so that I can actually work with law enforcement. So there's a couple things. You know, it's not, don't want to shoulder all of this, uh, you know, collective defense, or if you will, the individual defense on the consumer certainly want, don't want to saddle it all in the business. I think this is a, an area for uh, cooperation. So before we kick things off today, I'm going to cover a quick uh, housekeeping set of items. Uh, I recommend that folks, you know, have, if you haven't already, and you're looking at the housekeeping information up in front of you, uh, use that 1-800 number to dial in. The audio quality is a little bit better than listening through your computer. Um, and, you know, we hope that you uh, use that as flagged on right here in front of you. Uh, secondly, I'm going to turn this over at the end to my colleague, Neil Gaudreau, who will be moderating the Q&A session. Uh, we're really taking your questions through the questions box on the left-hand side of your screen. So if you do have a question for us or one of the panelists today, uh, please include your name in the question as well as your question. Let, also let us know if you have any uh, troubleshooting issues uh, with the web platform. Uh, hopefully you won't and our support team will be standing by to assist you. Uh, finally, uh, today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted on our website in the uh, coming weeks. We'll have a couple details on that uh, on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, and lastly, uh, we'll be posting a survey on the screen as the webinar is wrapping up. We uh, can't get better at doing this without your feedback. Uh, tell us whether the uh, information is timely at the right level of detail. Uh, you know, let us... Uh, let us know how we can, uh, you know, better get some throughput here. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, would really appreciate your reamplification of this, uh, especially as we go to post these slides and this the audio uh, later. Uh, getting other people who, you know, you, I guess I, I always like to say you you may be the expert and have everything figured out, but there's probably somebody you're knowing of that uh, could benefit from hearing this material and and hearing the speakers. So thanks for your attention today, uh, and on with the program. Uh, today we're very fortunate to have with us two very esteemed panelists, Michelle Mazina and Mark Grants. Um, Michelle comes to us from uh, the uh, FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation Cyber Division. She's an intel analyst there. Uh, she belongs to the Cybercrime Intelligence Unit at FBI headquarters in, in New York. Uh, where she focuses on integrating and engaging with private sector partners on cyber threats. Uh, she's been in that position since uh, 2018. Uh, Mark Grant is a supervisory special agent. He's also the assistant to the special agent in charge uh, in the U.S. Secret Services uh, Technical Security Division. Quite a mouthful. I'm sure Mark will explain a lot of that as he kind of runs through his, but he's been with the uh, Secret Service for over two decades, uh, works towards implementations of security controls on networks, information systems, and critical infrastructure uh, to eliminate and reduce the risk of cyber attack. Uh, it's a, a daunting space, and uh, Mark's got a lot of expertise in that. Uh, he currently supervises the Technical Security Division's Network Operations Branch. So, Michelle and Mark, uh, thank you for joining us on behalf of our listeners. And, Michelle, I'll let you take it from here. Hi, everyone, or good morning if you're joining us from the West Coast. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining us today. So today we'll be talking about the threat of e-skimming. We will start by touching on the evolution of credit card theft to lead into what it is that we're defining as e-skimming, who's being targeted, how they're compromised, and we'll finish with some warning signs to look out for and recommendations for protecting your businesses. So if this is your business, then you're in luck. 
you are safe. But everyone else in the room, you might want to pay attention. <laughs> so first we want to point out why this shift to e-commerce is so important. So historically, credit card information was most commonly stolen by compromising point-of-sale terminals or by using physical skimming devices, both of which would give criminals access to all of the card data stored within the magnetic stripe of your credit card. So if you're not familiar with these, point-of-sale attacks are the result of an actor compromising and moving across the victim or retail store network to the payment terminal and inserting malware that allows the actor to collect the credit card information that's that's stored when a payment cards are swiped by customers. Gas and ATM skimmers uh, have also been fairly common. Actors will place a device on the machines which copies payment card data once the card is unwittingly inserted through the skimmer for payment. Now while both of these attacks are still prevalent today, we're also seeing the shift to card not present compromises as indicated by what we're calling e-skimming attacks. So the shift seems to follow the implementation of security policies, which were put in place to protect the physical card transactions. Um, you're probably familiar with a U.S. transitioning to EMV chip authentication for all credit cards and point of sale terminals in 2015. That's when we all had to get our new credit cards with the, the chip added on them for that extra layer of protection for when you're presenting your card and swiping it for a payment. Other card security policies limit the storing of certain customer authentication information for once a charge is authorized, and that includes that card verification value or CVV, that number that you'll see on the back of your credit cards. So e-skimming attacks are emerging as cyber criminals are now able to circ circumvent some of those security standards by targeting the online environment and e-commerce and copying that payment card data before it's submitted and then sent to uh, a server where it may be encrypted. So they've been using malicious scripts uh, to capture that data from checkout pages on websites. And before a customer pushes submit and it's sent to a server and stored, and before that CVV and other data is not stored by a business for security reasons, is ultimately dropped. So this is allowing them to capture all of that payment information, giving them ultimately a complete customer profile in real time which provides for a more lucrative outcome for the criminal and then a more damaging one for the victim. So to give you a better visual, think of your traditional skimming, which uses a device added to an ATM machine or a gas pump, as we explained here. Um, which that's capturing the credit card information as the customer is inputting their card through a machine. So this is the same process for e-skimming, except it's done virtually. As the customer inputs their data on a checkout page, it's being captured and sent to the criminal. So now we can really go, into, go further into emphasizing how e-skimming, the online attack, differs from these other methods of credit card data theft. So who has heard of Magecart, digital skimming, form jacking, sniffers, card scrapers? All of these terms refer to what we're talking about today, which is the threat known as e-skimming. So as I mentioned, uh, e-skimming is the process of cyber criminals introducing a skimming code onto e-commerce payment card processing web pages in order to ultimately capture a payment card and personally identifiable information. So think basically any of the information that you type into a checkout page when you're making an online purchase. That is typically stolen from that checkout page of a website as you're making the purchase. Um, that could be you know, your, anything you're ordering online, your full card number, of course, but also your name, address, expiration date. It can all be captured in real time with no notice to the customer. The purchase will go through completely unaffected as the data you're typing in is captured and then sent to the domain or server controlled by the cyber criminal, but also to the business, so your purchase is going through um, you know, with no, no notice to anyone. So any business accepting online payments on their website is at risk of an e-skimming attack. There's no specific sector that we're seeing being targeted. Um, as the, the victims we're seeing deal in a wide variety of goods and services, impacting e-commerce companies in the retail, entertainment, and travel industries, as well as utility companies and third-party vendors, all ranging from small businesses to large corporations. Victims can be directly targeted, which is what we see with some e-commerce businesses, or more commonly, third parties and supply chains are being targeted in order to affect the main business that customers are interacting with. And we'll explain this further in just a bit. So if we take a look at the diagram, our users here can be any individual entering their credit card information into any website checkout page to make an online purchase or payment. 
So this page will have been compromised in one of many ways, which we'll go into next. But as we mentioned, e-skimming does not affect a customer's purchase. So you can see that purchase will go through business as usual. So nothing's tipping off the customer that they're about to be compromised. So on the other hand, you can see here that the same car data that was entered and sent to the business server is also being copied and sent to a server that's under the control of the actor who had entered that malicious code. So the customer's visit to the website and checkout process is not affected. So there won't be any obvious or, or immediate warning signs to the customer or the merchant that there's an intruder in their purchase capturing that information as well. Now what happens with that stolen data? Um, it can be sold on criminal marketplaces for a profit or used to make fraudulent purchases, or even further than used in reshipping schemes. Now we'll take a look at the next graphic. This can give you a very basic idea of the impact that's made through the vast range of victims an attacker can reach just by compromising one vendor. So this is what we want to get across when we explain this supply chain or third party attacks. So by compromising, for example, a payment platform vendor, which would be our third party circled here, the actor then has access to all of the businesses that that payment service is supplied to, represented here by all the web pages connected to that one vendor. And this is just by conducting that one attack. So this can be through a wide variety of means, um, exploiting a vulnerability in payment platform vendors, or even the little customer service chat bot that pops up when you visit a site, um, advertisements running on a web page, marketing or any invisible web analytic trackers running in the background of a site, or really any other widget or service that's outsourced by that main company to load onto their website in order to improve its functionality. Businesses are allowing these services to run on their websites, um, often unchecked and with much less security than the main site itself. Hackers are exploiting this trusted relationship and can compromise these background programs by injecting their JavaScript with the, sim the skimmer code. And this code then allows the actor to capture the data of every customer of every website that loads that third-party service onto their site. So how are they able to do this? Well, it seems e-skimming started as an online attack through a vulnerability in an e-commerce platform. So we've seen it expand across many industries using a wide variety of tactics and points of entry. As we mentioned, there's many of these services that generally are used to manage a business's shopping cart, checkout page, or other parts of their website. The attacks now have evolved to access the desired data and inject that e-skimming code through a variety of entry points. So I'll go over a few ways that skimming code is introduced to the payment card uh, websites. So this can start by compromising an actual victim network. Cyber criminals can gain access to that network through a phishing email or brute force of administrative credentials, and then directly modify the website's code to capture that, to capture that data. Then there's a few points which would follow the diagrams that we just showed on the previous slide. So again, um, compromising the payment platform vendor that a company uses for their website. They can find and exploit a vulnerability in that e-commerce platform used to support uh, you know, the ability for the particular website to accept and process cards for payment. Cyber criminals can compromise one e-commerce platform provider and ultimately skim data from the website of every company that uses that payment platform. This is similar with compromises of third parties and supply chain. The skimming code is injected into the JavaScript and loaded by the third party service onto victim sites. So in the supply chain infection vector, skimming code is applied to advertisements, live chats, widgets, customer support ratings, like we were saying before. Um, and attacking these supply chains allow an actor to compromise a wide range of victims that use that vendor's service. So ultimately, it is possible to steal the credit card information of every customer making a payment on every website that uses that one third-party service. This method is really allowing cyber criminals to maximize their impact because of that victim reach. So but it's also because it's somewhat off the radar of the main business whose customers are actually having their information stolen from their site. Because although that main website and business who's attracting the customers may have a really great security, the supply chain with access to that site may not. Uh, that's why we really want to emphasize this point as something for companies to be aware of. So who is doing this? Well, the marketing of this particular cybercrime allows for criminals of varying levels of understanding and skill sets to steal 
payment card data. We've seen some sophisticated campaigns and techniques for obfuscating the actor's identity or presence on a site, but really this process of injecting the skimming code can be a little bit more simple. So because of the prevalence of crime as a service, some of these codes can even be sold as a service, allowing for criminals without that technical understanding of JavaScript or coding to use these tools in order to target victim sites and collect stolen car data. So regardless if this is one person, a team, or several groups, this is an evolving threat and why we feel that it's, it's so important to spread the awareness of this threat so that steps can be taken to sanitize your systems throughout each layer of the website and, and throughout the payment card process in order to try to mitigate the impact. So now I'll turn it over to Mark. Um, he'll drill down and take a closer look at some of the more technical pieces of a web page and how e-skimming works. Mark? Thanks, Michelle. All right, we're going to, uh, as Michelle said, uh, drill down a little bit, get a little more detail. Um, one of the things that I'd like to touch on, just as Michelle was talking about, who our adversary is, who we're going against. Um, I know the image we use is, is one that everybody uses for hackers, the, uh, the young man sitting in his basement with his hoodie on. But please, as you listen to uh, what we're presenting to you today, keep in mind that these hackers are also businessmen and businesswomen. Uh, they make decisions based on risk. They make decisions based on return on investment. And so uh, what we will talk about uh, will help you utilize that same strategy that you would use in business against uh, our adversaries. So, all right, looking a little deeper into what, uh, what's behind a website. Um, this is primarily for the, uh, for the small, medium business owners out there, not our web developers. But if you're not aware of how websites built, uh, essentially you've got three main components. You've got HTML, you've got CSS cascading style sheets, and JavaScript. HTML, your hypertext markup language, gives your website the framework. Uh, is kind of the building blocks. Cascading style sheets, as you can, uh, as you can guess, gives it somewhat of a, a style system to it. And, and finally, JavaScript is the most important part. That's what gives your website that uh, functionality, the, the ability to interact with the user. And almost every website, I think the numbers are probably close to 95% of, of almost all websites have JavaScript. And again, JavaScript is what allows that, uh, that customer or that viewer at home to be able to click on buttons and uh, make the website do different things. So looking a little closer at JavaScript, here we have an example of a, uh, of a checkout page, um, generic, uh, which you would see on almost any e-commerce site. As you can see here, I'm in the process of purchasing a, a fine pair of tennis shoes. Um, but what's actually going on in the background in your browser? Uh, this is where we have these hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of lines of code. Uh, this is just a small sample here. I think we're only down to about 37 lines, if you can read that. But this is where our hackers are getting that access to our web servers and making changes, adding code, uh, making alterations to what we should see operating um, are now not, uh, not doing as we uh, originally prescribed them to do. So I'm going to give you another little example. I, I gave this presentation a couple months ago in St. Louis, and, and as I was prepping, I was reading the local paper there and uh, online, and, and I came across this headline. And what I did is, is an example of uh, a, a very simple trick that you can pull with JavaScript is I can download the web page onto my computer. So when I downloaded it, I downloaded all those lines of JavaScript. Now, essentially, I own it, similar to the way a hacker would, uh, would own your web server. And I made a few changes um, because the Secret Service is always uh, chasing the FBI, you know, a, a couple strokes of the keyboard. Now, all of a sudden, that headline that uh, was touting the FBI's work is, is now, uh, now reading that the Secret Service did it. Now, mind you, I did not hack into St. Louis Post-Dispatch. This is done locally on my computer. Uh, you can kind of tell there on the lower right how the advertisements don't show up. Um, but if I was able to make, uh, if I was able to gain access to the, uh, to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, uh, I can just as easily change FBI to Secret Service as I can go into their, uh, their checkout page and add uh, as, as little as half a dozen, ten lines of code that will copy all of the uh, fields that are filled into, primarily credit card information, and have that exfiltrated. 
So let's look a little more uh, a little more closely. This is uh, courtesy of, of Group IB, uh, a cybersecurity firm. And again, we're looking at the uh, the JavaScript. We're on line 770 here, and in that red box, you'll see uh, code. Primarily, if you look at that bottom line, uh, that code right there, the uh, in parentheses, is an obfuscated URL. And what this uh, what this portion of code is telling your browser to do is to reach out to that URL and pull down some additional uh, instructions. Now, as a security professional, if I'm looking at my website, I've got an e-commerce business, um, to do the, the, the work on my web server, uh, generally I'm going to look at it in developer mode. Okay? And different browsers have different tools. But again, looking at uh, our adversaries, our hackers as business people, they recognize that their tools are sometimes easily discoverable when, when uh, looking at them in, dis in uh, developer mode. So here's an example. This is a little bit longer. I don't know how, uh, how well you'll be able to read this code, but for our JavaScript experts out there, our hackers in this case have actually put a, a safety switch, so to speak, into their code, wherein if the, uh, the e-skimming tools are loaded, if they notice that uh, the browser is looking or attempting to look at the code in developer mode, it essentially puts that e-skimming code into sleep mode, uh, and makes it disappear. So while I'm looking at it in developer mode, I don't see anything, but as soon as I close developer mode and I go back to that website on a, on a regular browser, now all of a sudden that code is once again running. And finally here uh, is probably the best illustration of, of what exactly is happening with that, uh, with that e-skimming e -skimming JavaScript is doing. You'll see in the top box there, uh, once again, that those are the, the fields that the e-skimming malware is grabbing. Uh, you see credit card owner in there, credit card number, um, email, telephone, all, all the good information that, uh, that every criminal is, uh, is looking to gather. And then at the bottom box, once again, you'll see a long string there. Again, that's a, uh, an exfiltration URL. Um, once that information is collected, uh, then it's pushed off to a server. Uh, and this is one of the challenges that law enforcement has. These servers often are in places that uh, aren't friendly to Western law enforcement. That's where your, uh, your information then resides. As Michelle mentioned earlier, one of our biggest concerns um, probably is the use of third-party applications running on your website. This could be an example of a chat box here, um, the surveys that are running in the background, marketing, uh, advertisements, uh, online advertisements are big. Uh, as we discussed earlier, if I can compromise, just using this example of this chat box here, whatever uh, business this is, if I can compromise this company that provides the chat box functionality, now I've compromised all of their customers. So instead of targeting just one business, uh, now I've potentially compromised hundreds at a time. So this is something that uh, every e-commerce business should be aware of what's running on their website. Staying with the theme of, uh, of business orientation for our, our hackers, uh, this is an advertisement here. And again, you can read it. Uh, these guys are, are fairly bold. Uh, they don't sense a whole lot of risk, so they, uh, within their own little circle of friends on, on the undercover forums, uh, they talk quite openly. Uh, you'll see this one here, an individual is offering services. Um, his tools are, are functional with Magento, OpenCart, OS Commerce. Uh, I know Magento tends to get the bulk of the, uh, of, of the focus in this area. Uh, but by all means, Magento is not the bad guy in this instance. Uh, it's pretty much all of the uh, e-commerce platforms uh, have some vulnerabilities or some vulnerabilities lie somewhere within your system and they're all being attacked. In this instance, uh, this individual focuses on providing that, that e-skimming software, uh, but his area of expertise is not essentially uh, getting that initial compromise. So what he's looking for is business partners who've been able to compromise a, an online business, partner with him, and now you've got that business arrangement that's solidified. Each one has a, a secure login. So if I'm partnering with that gentleman that has the software, now I can log in. I provide him with access to the server or to the third-party services. 
Uh, and then in real time, I can go in and view the amount of uh, infections that I have. I can view the output uh, and directly pull the, uh, the stolen data that, uh, that is being generated from, uh, from my nefarious actions. So Bradford talked earlier about some, some general statistics. Uh, you know, so this is to some degree the, uh, the scary part of the, of the presentation. Um, these are a little bit dated, uh, going back uh, about eight months or so. Uh, these are courtesy of our friends at Sanguine Security, a uh, firm over in Europe that's been extremely helpful and, and one of the leading experts in this area. Uh, see here, 40,000 stores infected since 2015, uh, 2,000 infections in, in a month. Uh, you'll notice that the infections in a month, are roughly a third of those, a little over a third of those, were reinfections. Again, what we're seeing quite frequently, especially with small and medium businesses, they're being advised that they've got an issue, that they make a quick fix, but unfortunately they're not completely eradicating the, uh, the infection. Uh, thus that leads to a, to a reinfection in, in relatively short order. Here again you'll see a little more detail almost day by day, uh, every couple of days, the amount of infections, the couple spikes that you see um, aren't necessarily overactive times for our hackers. Uh, those are actually periods where Sanguine Security changed their, uh, their parameters, uh, their heuristics to discover these, uh, uh, these attacks. And so you, you see it uh, a little more often spike up. Uh, but on average, we're seeing approximately 50, upwards of 100 websites a day uh, to be infected. So what are our warning signs? Um, unfortunately, you're going to have to be paying very close attention. Uh, catch these, these type of attacks. One of the first things uh, you should be looking at is your logs, uh, FTP logs, SSH logs. Uh, I, I've had the opportunity to sit down um, with a number of different hackers, one of which was, was very blunt uh, in saying that, that he's quite surprised that hackers aren't caught more often because uh, try as they might to, to hide log activity, there's always something there. And if you're looking for it, you're going to find it. You know, that's, that's, once again, straight from the horse's mouth. So if you're not doing some type of review, I would suggest that would be something to look into. But look at your systems. Look for unexpected activity. Uh, obviously, if you're getting fraud complaints from your financial institution, that's a huge red flag. The phrase that's quite often used there is a common point of purchase. Um, if you're seeing your uh, activity being directed to new domains, especially if it's a foreign domain that you're not familiar with, that's another red flag. Uh, and again, if you can, look for modifications in your code. So more, uh, more suggestions. We'll, we'll start out with some of the more broad things. Uh, I, I can't emphasize enough good cyber hygiene. Uh, again, I speak quite frequently at various conferences. A lot of uh, small businesses, medium businesses, you know, have that fear of, Fancy Bear and state-sponsored actors and super hackers getting into their spaces. Um, and, and I think to some degree, oftentimes, just kind of throw their hands up and feel uh, that, that they're completely overmatched. Uh, those kind of folks are few and far between. They're not targeting um, always the, the small, medium business. And, and regardless if they are or not, it's no reason not to provide as much security for your, uh, your organization as you can. Uh, oftentimes, those, those lower levels, that basic cyber hygiene, are, are highly attainable. They're not that expensive. Uh, it just takes time and some strategy. So again, if you're in e-commerce, obviously, you should be familiar with PCI DSS. That's a great place to start. Um, but some of the more simple things are updating your, your operating system, updating your software. Um, change default credentials. I can't tell you how many investigations I've launched, and, and that's been the, uh, the, the root cause of how the, the initial patient zero was compromised, was uh, default credentials that were sitting in there. Least privilege strategy, if you're not familiar, uh, everyone in your organization should not, should not be a super user. Um, limit the amount of access that some of your employees have. If you're working simply as the, the mailroom clerk, you don't need full access to uh, your company's crown jewels. Wherever possible, use complex passwords and two-factor authentication. Educate your employees and use the tools that are available to you. Uh, intrusion detection tools, antivirus, firewalls, 
all these things are available. And once again, these these tips, uh, these, these uh, suggestions aren't going to make you bulletproof, but there's no sense not doing it. It's going to make you harder to compromise than the, uh, than the business next door. And then jumping into e-commerce specific recommendations, uh, sub-resource integrity checks, essentially what you're going to do to your website, and, and we saw the pictures before, the number of code, you're going to do uh, What's, what's similar to a hash value, almost like fingerprinting your website. And whenever that fingerprint changes, then you need to look into it. Now, in, in one sense, that seems very simple, but obviously today's websites are, are uh, far more dynamic. There's frequent changes, so that's going to take some uh, infrastructure to, to keep up with those changes and know what changes are authorized and which aren't. Uh, but it's certainly something, uh, an option to look into. Isolate your payment page. I know specifically with, with Magento and most of the e-commerce platforms, they have a default URL where your checkout page is, uh, is hosted. Uh, that can be changed. Our adversaries, again, looking to be as efficient business people as possible, are doing remote scanning. So they're looking for that default URL where your checkout page should be. Uh, if your checkout page isn't there, you get passed over. Again, it's not 100%, uh, but you want to harden yourself as much as possible. Uh, same thing, separating your checkout page. Uh, iframes are effective. They're not um, foolproof, but again, you want to make yourself a tougher target than, uh, than the next business. Limiting third-party applications, we talked about that already. Uh, again, we understand that that's part of business. Oftentimes, they're either generating income or they're providing value to your business. But at a minimum, be selective and, and limit the amount of third-party applications that are running, especially on your checkout page. Uh, content security policy headers, very similar to sub-resource integrity checks. And limit the access to your, uh, your e-commerce admin panel. Um, Whitelisting uh, the IP, is very, uh, IP address is very effective. So finally, uh, all things have gone wrong. If you are a victim, uh, first thing you should be doing is pulling out your uh, your cyber incident response plan. I uh, can't, again, stress this enough. Every business should have a response plan. If you're online, uh, there's a chance you're going to be victimized. And what I don't want is uh, for there to be panic in the air and everybody just trying to figure out what's going to happen uh, and who should be called and when. Uh, those plans should be on paper. Uh, ideally, they should be practiced. And a, a part of that plan should be having a liaison, having a relationship with the Secret Service or the FBI. Uh, I encourage everyone to, uh, to look up their Electronic Crimes Task Force, which is the Secret Service's model of, uh, of public outreach, or on the FBI side, the InfraGuard chapters. Uh, again, I'd much rather talk to you at a, uh, at a quarterly meeting over a cup of coffee and have a nice casual conversation. Uh, as opposed to our very first conversation being because your entire website has been compromised. So um, if I can just quickly get on my, uh, my soapbox, again, the responsibilities uh, lie within the business owners a lot of times. Uh, you're responsible for your business. Uh, these type of attacks affect your business. They affect your customers. Uh, and they affect your employees, too, because as uh, we talked earlier, these can negatively, uh, these type of incidents can negatively affect your overall business. So please take the time, be serious about this, learn what you can. Uh, it, it's not unattainable to make yourself a hard target. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Neil and you can uh, take a look at some of the questions that have popped up. Okay, thanks Mark. Good information. <clears throat> Uh, if you do have questions, uh, as a reminder, on uh, the bottom left of our, your browser, you have the opportunity to plug in some questions there. And we have several questions that have come in. The first one we have out there is, uh, what signs can we look for to determine if a client is compromised early on? Mark, would you like to field that, Mich or Michelle? Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. Um, you know, we kind of touched on it. In the, uh, in the beginning, one of the things that I forgot to mention, I think it's at the bottom of the slide, your customers, unfortunately, aren't going to notice anything. Um, if your website's been compromised, if that e-skimming code's been introduced into your website, uh, as Michelle described earlier, when you perform that credit card process, 
you know, the, the credit card's still going to go through, the purchase is still going to be, uh, be confirmed, but that, uh, that spare copy of your credit card data is being pushed off to another server. So uh, as, as, a, as a customer, as, as a uh, person that shops probably too much myself online, uh, unfortunately, you're not going to notice. Now, keep track of your credit card statements. Make sure that you don't see any expected charges. That's kind of basic security. From a business owner, though, again, you want to really take a close look at those logs. Um, it's not something that's simple, but if you can do the sub-resource integrity checks and, and keep track of what is being changed, uh, those are things that are, that are really going to jump out at you. That uh, If all of a sudden you see traffic being pushed to a server in Moscow uh, and you don't do a whole lot of business in Moscow, that might be uh, something to look into. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, as a credit card issuer, is there a place to report a compromised website which uh, you do not own? We heard a little earlier about, uh, on the previous slide, three organizations that you could uh, report an incident, but if you notice one, is there a place that folks can go to report that? Michelle, could you feel that question? Sure. I mean, sure. I, I, I think I would say still that, that last um, slide there where we had, you know, our, your field offices, I think that that's probably the best place to start. You know, I know with Secret Service and with FBI, we both have um, case teams that are actively looking into this threat. So they'd be happy to, you know, even if it's not your website, um, you know, if, if we're aware of it, they can probably make contact with, with that company or, you know, try to mitigate it somehow. So I would think Probably the best place is to start with, you know, either one of the, you know, your local offices. Um. Appreciate that. And um, the next question we have is, uh, and I think we heard a little bit about this through the presentation as well. And it is the question is, would vulnerability assessments, code reviews, or pen testing be the best to determine if you're vulnerable? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and to take it a step further, I know with Magento, um, there are actually online tools where you can point URL, URL of your checkout page to essentially a tester that will ping the browser, ping the code that's in there, and tell you where your deficiencies are, where your updates need to be. Uh, so some of that is actually automated. And, and again, if you're a, a Magento customer, again, that's kind of the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest of, of the e-commerce platforms. Uh, I know that one's available. I would assume that uh, Open Commerce and some of the other ones have similar tools where you'll get almost a, a color-coordinated report that will give you red checks, green checks, yellow checks, and uh, give, you, give you a sense of where your uh, deficiencies are at. Beyond that, there are obviously some, some outstanding cybersecurity experts in the field, uh, Risk IQ, Sanguine Security. Some of these folks uh, have been studying this for, for five or six years. So there's definitely some, uh, some expertise that's available. Great. The next question we had come in was uh, making a payment or purchase on a site via a VPN connection. Is there the possibility and is there a threat of your data being captured? Yeah, unfortunately, VPN isn't going to help you here. Um, what, what's happening when your, your credit card data is being stolen is uh, it, it's almost like a keylogger. It's capturing whatever you're typing into the, into the checkout page. So now, if you are concerned yourself, you're shopping on a website that's uh, you know that you've never been to before. Maybe it isn't one of the bigger websites. Um, what you can do is when you make that initial purchase, oftentimes you'll be asked if you want to save your your personal data with that company. They'll save your name, your credit card information, so that subsequent purchases, you don't have to type it in. Um, that gives you the advantage that on a secondary, third, fourth, fifth time you make a purchase, because you're not typing in that data, you're not vulnerable to an e-skimming attack. Um, now, the flip side is as a user, now you're also trusting that company with your data. And hopefully, they're protecting it well, but uh, that does minimize some of the risk uh, in, in future purchases. On the flip side, from a business perspective, if you don't want to deal with your own credit card processing, uh, you can employ Google Pay, you can employ Amazon Pay. Uh, 
so that those purchases aren't even really done on your systems. They're, they're done outside of that. From my business knowledge, I'm assuming they're going to take a little bit of a cut, uh, but at the same time, you've, you've now mitigated that risk of handling credit card debt. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next question. How can you tell if the default URL has been changed or hijacked? Are there means that you can, as an application developer, as a user, I mean, there are there things we should be looking for? So if, if we're looking at the default URL of, of your checkout page, uh, that's something that you're going to change. Uh, I'm not that well versed in Magento, um, but I, you know, I do understand that you can go into and change that default password. Uh, once again, as, as, a, as a user, that's something that you're not going to see that happens in the background. Um, and, and again, you're also, uh, as, as a, a user, as a customer, or the business owner, very easy not to catch those um, where the exfiltration URL is injected into your JavaScript. Because I uh, saw um, many of these uh, web pages are thousands of lines long. It's not like I can, uh, I can hire a college intern to, to go through the code. Um, you know, that's something that needs a little more information recognizing what should be there and shouldn't be there. Okay, great, thanks so much. Uh, next question we have is, how effective are antivirus, anti-malware programs at recognizing these injections and the definitions that are uh, used to support those? Michelle, would you like to take that one? Yeah, that, uh, I'm not too sure how to answer that, but I, I know, um, you know, a lot of times you see people are getting compromised because those those things are not in place or they're not, um, more importantly, they're not updated. So as far as that goes, making sure that if you have these, these antivirus, anti-malware, um, these programs and software in, intact in your, with your systems, making sure they're updated is something that's that's most uh, most important because it's that you know once they're outdated or there's a patch that's released and it's not implemented, um, that's the vulnerability that they're that they're targeting. Um, and I know I've I've heard a lot about um, a concern with you know uh, different functionalities with your websites. Um, it's out of date now. You know you should update it, but maybe haven't because um, by updating it, you might lose some customization that, you know, that you might have paid for earlier on. Um, it's kind of, you kind of have to outweigh the risks there. I, you know, rebuilding something is more important than probably than getting compromised because, you know, something might be out of date. So it's definitely something to keep in mind, too. I don't know if that, if that really helps answer that question, but... Okay, yes, great. Appreciate that. Um, we've got time for one more question. Uh, I'm going to ask Mark to field this one here. And the question is, what are the most effective best practices organizations can use to help monitor for e-skimming? I think we heard a little bit about that. I just want to reemphasize. I think the importance of those best practices uh, need to be brought up again. Yeah. From a best practices standpoint, um, again, just to, to cover some of the things that we talked about, I can't stress basic cyber hygiene enough. Um, you know, again, not reusing passwords, using complex passwords, all those things are, are very basic that uh, every organization is following. Um, but, but utilize the resources that are out there. PCI DSS um, has some excellent standards. I know, especially for small and medium businesses, that's a self-test, uh, and, and quite often it's, it's just easy to check the box and say that you're compliant with everything. Um, but, you know, before you check that box, as a business owner, I would recommend and, and signing someone within your company, ideally if you have the manpower that's responsible for cybersecurity. Look, uh, look beyond just that, uh, that little check box that says you're good to go getting down in the weeds, the sub-resource integrity checks, probably the best solution. Um, it's not a simple one, but, uh, but, it, but it is probably the best solution that, that takes a little bit of an effort. Uh, I know just recently, last week, um, there was some articles, uh, organization uh, bought a company, out of, a security company out of uh, Israel that uh, is looking at an automated tool 
that uh, supposedly is going to be the solution. So I know this is a very hot topic. I've had discussions with members of the credit card industry. Uh, this is definitely on their radar. So for the highly technical folks out there, you can develop a solution that's easy to implement, cost-effective. Uh, there's certainly a market for it. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so that concludes our Q&A portion of today's webinar. I want to thank uh, Michelle and Mark. Great job. Appreciate the good information. Um, I think we heard a couple common themes. Hygiene, know your, uh, your vendor partners, affiliates, uh, supply chain risk management, uh, source code, uh, look at, assess your assets that are publicly exposed. Uh, so a lot of good information here. Uh, I want to thank the audience for coming out today and tuning in. Um, the last page will have some additional information on uh, e-skimming. Um, it is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, so uh, I ask that you uh, go to uh, dhscisa.gov uh, and take a look at um, that information if you're not aware and pass that information out to your teams. You can also check out the e-skimming informational flyer that will be posted as well. And again, this will be recorded. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's webinar, webinar and uh, we encourage you to visit our website to sign up for additional alerts, updates, and future webinars. So with that, thank you for participating. Have a good day. That does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your line.